us tonight is Dr. Michael Lipson. Uh, Dr. Lipson is an optometrist and assistant professor at University of Michigan's Kellogg Eye Center. His clinical practice involves contact lenses with emphasis on specialty contact lenses, overnight corneal reshaping, keratoconus, post-corneal transplant, post-refractive surgery, and severe dry eye patients. He conducts clinical research studies on corneal reshaping, vision-related quality of life, myopia control, and new lens designs. He lectures nationally and internationally on specialty contact lenses and research topics. He's a consultant to Bausch & Lomb's specialty vision products relative to Ortho-K education and other specialty vision products. He's on the GPLI Advisory Board and last year served as a Vice President of the Scleral Lens Education Society. He attended Michigan State University, received his OD degree from the Illinois College of Optometry. Dr. Michaud, our other presenter, graduated from the University of Montreal College of Optometry in 1986, where he also obtained his master's degree in physiological optics. Dr. Michaud is a full professor and practices at University of Montreal and has done so since 2001 uh, as the chief of the contact lens department. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a diplomat, uh, the British Contact Lens Association, the Scleral Lens Education Society, and the European Academy of Optometry and Optics. Dr. Michaud has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and publications or other professional reviews. He's often been invited to speak in Europe, Asia, and the United States. Finally, Dr. Michaud is the current president of the College of Optometrists of Quebec. We're very happy to have both of these distinguished speakers with us tonight. A quick thank you to our sponsors before I turn it over here. We'll start with our diamond sponsors, which are Art Optical, AVT, Bausch & Lohm, and Blanchard. We also have a number of platinum sponsors, including AccuLens, Alden Optical, Conomac, Essilor, Menicon, OptiView, Paragon Vision Sciences, Synergize, Trueform Optics, Visionary Optics, and Excel Specialty Contacts. And finally, our silver and bronze sponsors include the Boston Foundation for Sight, ABB Optical Group, Visionary, Easy Lens Applicator, Today's Vision, and Valley Contacts. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Michael Lipson. Well, thank you very much for that uh, good introduction, Drew. And uh, we're going through uh, troubleshooting. This is part two. We did a previous one about a month or two ago. And this is a little more advanced tonight, but in scleral lenses, obviously, we have a number of issues that uh, give us problems, and we're going to try to address those and what they are and how to manage those. Uh, starting right off on the front surface of scleral lenses, are, we're going to start with anterior surface deposits. And obviously, uh, we've all seen this with regular gas permeable lenses as well, but uh, there's various causes involving uh, anterior segment conditions like blepharitis or rosacea and allergies as well. But uh, some of the patients we're working with on scleral lenses have other issues going on with their physical and visual conditions and lends itself to poor tear film chemistry. And uh, these are especially evident in the severe dry eye patients. Again, these are the kind of patient-related things. There are also external issues, such as uh, makeup and mascara. We'll go into that in just a little more detail in a minute. But uh, the other issue that we have a little more control over is the lens material that's used on our scleral lenses and the uh, wetting characteristics of those materials. So when we do find um, ocular surface issues and, and anterior segment issues, to deal with those, some people advocate, and, and I, I would strongly recommend this, before you even start, you're doing an assessment of the patient. And to if you detect these things, you're going to treat these first before you introduce lenses into that system. So in other words, if you have uh, blepharitis, uh, you're going to treat that with lid hygiene, uh, severe dry eyes. Some people are into the uh, omega-3s, and they shown pretty good promise on that, as well as uh, topical drops and uh, antibiotics such as azacite. And people seem to be uh, responding to this fairly well. Sometimes it's very short-lived treatments of uh, one or two weeks, and sometimes it involves closer to uh, one to two months 
but uh, again, you want to see the lid and the anterior surface of the eye looking as good as possible before you start. Relative to dry eyes, we want to stabilize that tear film and normal dry eye treatments should be uh, enlisted in this, such as uh, lubricating drops, a variety of different types of those uh, on a very regular basis, and in addition to possibly oral medications like tetracyclines to alter the uh, tear chemistry. Another issue that we deal with, like I said, I just mentioned before, relative to the material itself and the wetting angle. Um, certainly each one is different. Uh, there are various manufacturers and all of them are high decay materials, but sometimes they react differently with different patients. Uh, so we have all these options available and to change material sometimes makes a difference, but we also have the option of plasma treating lenses, which has become almost a standard, and now we have the new Hydropeg as an option. I'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. The other thing we have a lot of control over is the solutions that come in contact with the lenses and the patient uses. The uh, alcohol-based cleaners can be very, very helpful in removing very stubborn deposits. I certainly recommend hydrogen peroxide for many, many patients, and uh, it seems to be not only a good disinfectant, but keeping that surface very wettable. And there are enzyme treatments, including the uh, progent, which is more of an acid treatment. But these are very, very good, what I call super cleaners. Here we are returning to the hydropeg. Uh, what is hydropeg, basically? It is a surface um, polymer, 90% water. It is permanently, covalently bonded to that lens surface. So it is not something that wears off and it is a, uh, a mucin-like coating on the surface, on both surfaces of the lens, total, everything on the lens. So the active ingredient is PEG uh, polyethylene glycol. And the diagrams show, like I said, what the normal tear film going over the lens looks like, and the hydropeg is basically in between the lens and that tear film and keeps it very, very wettable. And we find it be very, very slippery, and uh, patients have noted quite a difference and, and we've been able to see it as well at the slit lamp. And again, the process of doing this is uh, kind of a two-step process. And you add a uh, functional activator to the uh, monomer mix and uh, or this plasma treatment. Now, if you remember, plasma treatment is not coating in itself. It's an ultra cleaning process. And uh, again, once it's clean like that, the lenses are soaked in the hydropeg polymers and uh, during the hydration step of lenses, and it can actually be added to the blister pack during the autoclaving. So it's, again, permanently covalently bonded to that lens surface. Really makes a big difference for many, many patients. On the last two topics of how do we manage all these issues with wetting and front surface deposits, certainly the patient has a lot of input into this in terms of their hands, anything that's in contact with their hands, their lids, uh, hand soaps, any, uh, makeup, lotions, makeup removers, eye creams, anything even near the eye can somehow find its way in there and interact with that lens surface and kind of mess things up on the surface. But we want to use hand soaps that are approved for contact lenses and uh, soaps without lotions or oil base. Again, makeup on the women who are using lenses should be used uh, after the lenses are in. There's one other thing that we, we like to talk about is when the lenses are on and they're getting some uh, front surface non-wetting issues, actually we can clean that lens uh, using a, a swab. If you use some solution on the cotton swab, whether it be a saline solution or something like a gas permeable wetting agent, sometimes you can wipe that off of there directly and it seems to work without having to remove the lens. But again, you gotta be careful to make sure that that's wet and it doesn't have any of the little fibers breaking off on there. So those are issues that involve uh, external things on the front surface of the lens. Now, these are things that we see if we move to the back surface of the lens, meaning between the lens and the eye, we see debris accumulating. 
right now, there's a variety of different theories on what the source of these are, but uh, analyzed uh, by some of the researchers on this, basically have found that it's usually lipids and mucins, and maybe from some of the goblet cells being aggravated by the lens on the conjunctival surface. And they have not been found to be proteins and not be found to be inflammatory cells. And it seems to be variable. We have some patients, no matter how they're fit, they still get these things. But again, there are some things involving the fit that we are able to do. And uh, it involves balancing the size of the lens, the clearance, and essentially whatever works. And right now we're at a point where we really don't know and we just have to keep trying alternatives to what we're using now. But in terms of what causes these things, the first theory on this is that, again, the landing zone may not be wide enough and it's pressing too hard in one particular area, stimulating some of those goblet cells to produce extra mucin there. Uh, it can be misaligned with the sclera, meaning it's different in one direction or one meridian than in the other one. And uh, again, once these cells are altered, it changes how they secrete their both the lipids and the mucins. So again, relative to edge design, it has to be a very, very smooth edge, obviously, because the lid is blinking over that edge. And to... Uh, find that sometimes these pieces of debris are actually kind of, so to speak, sucked under the lens. There may be fluid forces under the lens based on uh, variable clearance. If the clearance is very high in the center and very shallow, it may create a negative gradient where these uh, particles are kind of drawn into and under the lens. But as we know, with scleral lenses, what you Put in that lens with the application solution that's in the bowl, the lens stays in there. There's not a lot of tear exchange. So any debris that is in there stays there. And if the cornea is uh, sloughing any epithelial cells, they can lodge in there as well. And that's basically on this second hypothesis here is that the corneal cells released from the surface during normal metabolic process uh, get trapped under there without being able to be flushed out. And again, if patients are found to be incompatible with a particular solution or a preservatives, uh, this can aggravate this situation. So again, you have to be very careful and we'll go over that later, but you wanna use preservative free and buffer free saline solution to apply the lens. But when you have these issues, both the front and the back surface, the, the clinical effects on this affect both comfort and visual acuity. Certainly visual acuity, if it gets bad enough on either surface, is definitely affected. Patients are saying my lenses are blurry or my vision gets blurry through the day. And it can occur immediately, almost immediately after application. It can happen sometimes much later in the day. But uh, it is annoying for patients because they may have to remove lenses periodically if there's no other solution that you can give them. And it's theorized that also as you apply and remove lenses numerous times during the day that that's an aggravation in and of itself and that it gets worse by doing that over time. So again, as a, a therapeutic uh, measure, scleral lenses may actually show some of these things getting better as they adapt to lenses. So we'll talk about that a little more later too. But it obviously is not convenient for them to have to remove lenses periodically during the day. So you know, as a summary of the management of the ocular uh, and the lens surface issues, both the front and the back surface, try to treat the ocular surface diseases uh, beforehand, treat them very aggressively, modify the fit so that the lens lands very, very smoothly, not uh, impeding or impinging on any one part of the lens, uh, the eye more than another and modify the curves, kind of reduce the limbal clearance. If you get too much limbal clearance, there's that force where you get accumulation of debris there. A third step on the lens parameters might be to try to reduce the central clearance as much as possible so that if you can uh, get it under 200 microns, generally you see less of these kinds of uh, debris problems behind the lens. 
by reducing the diameter of the lens, you can actually reduce the area that's of the square that the lens is landing on and the, the mechanical effects of the lens are minimized. One other thing that has been tried is a, a various cocktail of solutions at application. Some people have said some kind of a, a more highly viscous than saline solution, maybe one drop should be put in the bowl of the lens prior to putting the saline in, and that may help give some wetting aspects to this, but it should be a preservative-free solution if possible. And finally, while the lens is in, uh, there's been a technique that's been advocated uh, by Dr. Christine Sint of uh, trying to replenish solution under the lens by actually squirting saline solution from the temporal aspect of your eye under the edge of the lens to actually try to circulate some tears. And uh, that technique you have to kind of observe and practice a little bit. But uh, this is where I'm going to transfer over to Dr. Michaud and uh, he's going to go over some oxygen things and this is what you typically will be looking at when you evaluate clearance. So, Vangis. Thank you, Michael. Uh, very nice uh, coverage of the uh, most common trouble uh, shooting thing that we can have in our regular practice. So, uh, talking about limiting the clearance uh, under the lens, is certainly related also to the concern that was developed over the last years uh, regarding oxygen delivery to the cornea. When you look at a picture like this one here, um, and we you see uh, that the scleral lens uh, on top of that cornea is quite you know thick compared to a small gas per lens, or obviously compared to a soft lens. Um, but the tear layer uh, is also as thick as the lens, uh, certainly at insertion, it varies during the day. But these two components act as a reservoir in series, as Irvin Fad described many, many years ago. Meaning that, you know, we have to consider them in conjunction and, and certainly as, as a single unit just for the delivery of the uh, oxygen to the cornea. And if we remember well, the um, uh, DK over T, DK meaning the uh, permeability of the material um, to the oxygen provide enough, uh, provide you know the uh, the nourishment for the cornea, and the T is the thickness. So this criteria, DK over T, is certainly one key element we have to look at when we prescribe contact lenses, no matter what you know type of lenses we are using. Holden Merz just described in the 80s that the minimal DK over T that is necessary to avoid corneal edema for daily wear was 24 of value and uh, not not the DK, the DK material of the material only but the DK over T considering the thickness and uh, there are some you know articles uh, looking at harmonic thickness of the lens meaning considering the overall lens thickness uh, if you have a minus six for example lens uh, it's very thin in the center but very thick in the periphery and obviously the cornea will not be affected the same way depending on the various thickness uh, over its surface. Harvard Bonanno uh, revisited the uh, Holden Merce criteria at the beginning of the uh, of the uh, 1995 around that and it was published in Optometry Vision Science and now the standard was to consider a DK over T as uh, minimal uh, of 35 uh, as minimal to avoid anoxia through the entire corneal surface and for extended wear 125. Eric Pappas um, confirmed the 125 uh, to avoid limbal injection, especially under you know, extended wear. And Morgan and Efron uh, did a clinical study that the first three ones, there they were, they were you know, theoretical concepts, but Morgan and Efron put soft lenses with various thickness in front of the cornea and they really evaluate the corneal response and they evaluate the, the edema created and the, the, the swelling of the uh, epithelial cells. And they, uh, they found that for the central cornea, 20 was the minimal DK over T value to avoid hypoxia. And over the limbus, it was 33. So again, you know, considering the overall big picture here, um, they suggested that a, a lens, a soft lens, should be fitted with material providing uh, at least 33 as DK of T value. But in several lenses, it may apply differently. 
um, we, we published that model, theoretical model, a few years ago, five years now, time flies, uh, believe me. And, and uh, we considered the same approach as Holden Mertz and Harvard Bonanno. And we compute uh, in our model the decay of any given lens material known at this point and still is still valuable because no new material was launched in the market. So the highest decay material was 170. And we, um, we, we compute that with considering various clearance under the lens. Again, we consider the lens thickness itself, but the uh, tear fluid layer thickness as well uh, in the unity that, that, we, um, that we just you know, studied as for the, the delivery of oxygen to the cornea. And we ended up with you know, the um, uh, minimal lens thickness possible to respect the Arvid Bonanno uh, and uh, criteria. And if you look at the table on the right hand side of, the, of that lens here, let's say that you have a Boston XO2 material with 150 uh, DK uh, value. Uh, you know, the uh, thinnest lens possible to manufacture is 250 microns. And at 156, uh, the next box, you know, the lens will be too thin and will break. So 250 is certainly minimal, but you know, if you look on the upper scale of, the, of that table, it drives you to a uh, clearance of 200 microns. Um, in fact, what that table tells you, and the model tells you, is that it's not possible to fit a lens thicker than 250 microns with more than 200 microns of clearance under it. Um, uh, to, to, to avoid apoxia, meaning that over that, uh, over these values, if the lens is thicker than that and if the clearance is higher than 200 microns, you will, in fact, in theory, um, create uh, edema. And obviously, this model is applicable across the board for the entire cornea, but we have to remember that the clearance under a solar lens is wedge-shaped, so you have a thicker tear reservoir in the central cornea and a very limited reservoir over the limbus, I basically 50, 60 microns. So there's no way we will, you know, induce edema over the limbus because we are way, you know, low compared to, to um, these, these models and these values in the model. So in theory, in, in, in summary of that model, uh, to avoid hypoxia, scleral lens should be fitted with 200 microns clearance, 250 microns of lens thickness using the highest decay material. If you use a decay material that is lower than that, Obviously, you have to reduce the lens thickness and or the clearance in order to um, to uh, avoid hypoxia. And it's also related to um, the level of clearance once the lens is stabilized over the cornea. We know that the clearance will vary over time. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a lot more you know, clearance at insertion and smaller lenses, that clearance will drop obviously, an average by 80 microns over the deep most of them, 50% of them, during the first 30 minutes of wear. And as for the larger lenses, because they lie on you know, a wider pad on the conjunctiva, they lose a little bit less fluid. And, and obviously, they, they, uh, they vary with 80 microns degree. So we, you have to take that in account. But the numbers of the theoretical model refer to the clearance once the lens is stabilized. And that model was heavily discussed at the time of publication. And um, a few uh, months later, in fact, a year later, Barry Wiseman and his, work, his team in uh, Southern California College of Optometry um, published uh, another approach, theoretical approach, uh, proving that, yes, corneal hypoxia can be triggered by the wear of several lenses. And in their conclusion, they confirmed that our you know, predictive model was, in fact, in fact, valid and true. Next slide, please. They also recommended that, you know, obviously lenses should be fitted with lower clearance and uh, manufacture with, you know, uh, a thinner approach. Same thing um, in a in, in, uh, few years later, uh, Vincent Gampian in, in, in uh, Spain confirmed also that model and uh, had the same conclusion. If you look at the manufacturer's recommendation, and I don't blame anyone here, I'm really a big fan of several lenses and manufacturers are doing a great job on that. But you know, um, what they recommend is habitually they will uh, manufacture their lens very thick. Why? Because they are afraid of lens uh, breakage, they lend, that the lens will break uh, when they are handled. 
um, they want to avoid also lens flexure. And, and, and I really want to address that because at the beginning, we, we certainly five years ago, we fitted you know, lenses, large lenses with spherical haptics, and the lens was not really well stable um, on the conjunctiva. And we had most of the time one quad, quadrant what, that was not really well aligned. Uh, with the lens and or the lens aligned with the conjunctiva. And uh, because of that, that unstable lens over the conjunctiva, obviously the lens uh, tend to warp if it was produced uh, very, very thin. But nowadays with the new approach that, you know, we develop in the fitting of lenses with, you know, quadrant specific or, you know, toric haptics, every practitioner around the world now tend really to align the, the, the spheral lens in every quadrant. And the manufacturers, uh, you know, really endorse that, those models and are now able to manufacture very, very sophisticated, you know, landing areas. Um, there's no need actually, I think, to keep the, this high thickness of, for the lenses to avoid breakage and, and to avoid lens flexure. Uh, certainly, manufacturers can do can do better on that. But the average is 45, uh, 0.45 millimeter or 40, 450 microns. Uh, they recommend also a traditional volt of you know 300 microns, uh, which is after stabilization again. And the traditional material they recommend uh, has a decay over of 100, 100 only. So if we compute those numbers, next slide, please. Um, if we com compute those numbers in the theoretical model we develop and confirmed by uh, Barry Weissman and Vincent Campan um, to other theoretical models, we end up with a DK over T of 12.1. If you remember what I just said, you know, a few minutes ago, the um, minimal DK over T based on Morgan and Efron clinical work in the central cornea uh, should be at least 20 and over the, uh, the, the stem cells and the limbal uh, periphery, the limbal area in the periphery of the cornea, it, it should be uh, at least 33 uh, DK or T value. So we are really, really low here. Uh, if we respect the manufacturer recommendation and we fit lenses according to these, you know, recommendations. So we, we can do better, I think, certainly, and we can ask manufacturers to produce lenses with, with the thickness that we want. And we can fit these lenses with, you know, low clearance, as, as, as we already uh, mentioned, to avoid debris and deposits in the bowl. And edema is there, and it was reported in many, many papers and, and many clinical, you know, posters uh, in many major conferences. Next slide, please. Um, and certainly, uh, we proved that in vivo. Again, remember Harvard Bonanno and all that stuff were, were theoretical model, Morgan and Efron, uh, came with a, a experimental study on in vivo study with cornea. Um, and we did the same with my friend uh, Claude Giasson in Montreal. Uh, we did that uh, measurement in vivo, the only study published so far um, related to spheral and square with in vivo results. So we, we developed uh, that study based on the uh, uh, Hill model of EOP, equivalent oxygen percentage. Um, which is, you know, which aims to estimate the partial pressure in oxygen at the corneal surface under contact lens wear. And the basis of that model is the oxygen consumption is increased immediately after contact lens wear or exposure to gases containing um, decreasing tension in, in oxygen. And that in you know, consumption, that increase in consumption is certainly in proportion to the level of hypoxia, meaning that, you know, the more cornea is suffering from hypoxia, more increase will be the oxygen com consumption just after removal of that, you know, hypoxic stress, which is a contact lens on top of the cornea. Next slide. So we end up with, with the, these numbers here. We compare the same lens, the same central thickness on the same patients, but fitted in one eye with, you know, in the 200, in around 200 microns, and on, on the same eye on, on the other day, or in some patient, the other eye, 400 microns. So we, we really doubled, you know, the clearance. And 400 microns is very near 
what what uh, is recommended by some manufacturers. Our lenses were a little bit thicker than than recommended. It they were around 300 microns. So this is why with the um, uh, 200 micron clearance, we were a little bit short compared to the uh, minimal PO2 value to avoid hypoxia, which is 9.9%. We ended up with a 9.1% in 5907. So it was very, very near. So meaning that 200 micron clearance and 300 microns thickness uh, was able to match the uh, minimal criteria to avoid hypoxia. But if we double that clearance going up to 400 microns, we drop the oxygen cons uh, delivery to the cornea. So we, the increase in the oxygen consumption after lens removal was 30% more. Uh, meaning that if you fit lenses with 400 microns, that means that you penalize the cornea by 30% of the oxygen available to um, that tissue habitually. Next slide. We, we see that in, in, in our clinical day-to-day um, -day activities, uh, especially on fragile tissue, fragile corneas, where the endothelial cell layer is compromised. Let's say that you have a post-graft patient with low endothelial cell count. Obviously, that cornea cannot suffer from any kind of hypoxic stress. And I saw in my practice, and there are some photos here, very explicit to that regard. I saw in my practice a few patients, you know, ended up with, you know, blanching and op uh, developing opacities over the graft in a matter of days, if not hours, after several lens fitting. And they, they did pretty well, and they were fine before that. So the only explanation was this hypoxic stress provided by you know, higher clearance and, and thicker lenses. And we saw that over the limbus as well, where the uh, micro, where the microcystic edema, as the photo uh, is showing here, um, is also found, especially if the clearance over the limbus is very high, uh, we can really penalize uh, the oxygen delivery to this uh, fragile tissue uh, over the limbal area. So uh, clinically speaking, uh, it was evaluated that it, this hypoxic stress, especially in the central cornea, can reach up to 1% to 3%. And it's very easy to assess in your own practice if you have a pachymeter doing the overall pachymetry of the cornea, not a single point, not a, not a touch, you know, point uh, or kind of bend to, to measure pachymetry. If you have a topo map going, giving you pachymetry, look at the uh, corneal thickness over time pre-wear and post-wear, and you, you'll be able to evaluate the swelling of that cornea and can reach up to 100, 150 microns sometimes. So it's one to 3% edema uh, after a single day. Some authors compare that to physiological edema, so it's not a big deal because, you know, you know when everybody wakes up in the morning with 4% edema, the main difference is that, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you expose your 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 corneas and, and your eyes to a regular atmosphere and, and there's an airflow going Going there, and you re can recuperate from that hypoxic stress and that hypoxia uh, in a matter of few minutes, in uh, one hour at the most. Um, in several lenses, let's say that you open your eyes, you have already 4% edema there, you put the lens in, and you still, you know, bring 3% edema during all wearing hours. So the cornea is never able to recuperate. And this is why these fragile corneas are showing these, these edema. We don't see stri, we don't see uh, microsis because the level of edema doesn't reach 7, 8, 9%. We don't see neovascularization a lot except in graft patients because there's really rarely a hypoxic stress over the limbus and, and oxygen diffusion cannot is is not possible in the cornea meaning that you know laterally uh, there's no oxygen if, if i provide enough oxygen on, on the limbus no way that you know this uh, oxygen will reach the central cornea so it, it's a diffusion from the anterior to the posterior surface of the cornea never from limbals to limbal from nasal to temporal side. So really important to address that and to respect um, that model. And nowadays we consider that, you know, to avoid that hypoxic stress, especially when you look at, you know, fragile corneas and or if you want to fit sterile lenses or normal cornea patients, because it's, it's a risk benefit ratio at the end. This is why this model was revisited. You know, if you have no other option than 
to fit a lens with a little bit too much clearance and a little bit too thick for that. But you know, your restorative vision, you treat a, a very severe eye with that slur lens. Obviously, I can really live with, with that potential of hypoxic stress. But if you have, you know, a presbyopic patient and you want to fit just a scleral lens for the purpose of improving vision or comfort because that patient is not dealing well with soft multifocal lenses, then yes, a two to three percent edema every day with an unknown long-term effect high is a high risk compared to the benefit of you know fitting several lenses there are ways to fit several lenses more safely in 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 those patients and that means to um, limit the lens thickness and to limit the clearance over the cornea next slide uh, michael please um so in conclusion yeah that that was my conclusion to fit with reduced thickness and to fit whenever possible uh, uh with a low uh, clearance uh after stabilization for sure you know if i want to end up with lower than 200 microns clearance considering that i will lose you know 100 microns during the day or 75 75 microns during the day for larger lenses i have to start with 250 to 60 at insertion but very rapidly in a matter of 30 minutes then i'm going on the safe side uh, of the curve and I'm, I'm dealing with less than 200 microns of clearance over that that cornea Especially over the limbus, that, that was a beautiful study published by Joe Barr and his team in Hawaii State. They, they fitted small, very small scleral lenses. And at this time, it, it's not hypoxia that is in play, it's more a mechanical issue because there was a touch over the limbus in most of these patients. And they proved that if you alter, if you touch the limbus, uh, with the scleral lens, certainly you will create a mechanical response. It's not a hypoxic response, it's a mechanical response, and you'll see a disruption of the epithelial little cells over there. Some authors will, will say that it, it can alter the stem cells, but the stem cells are located very, very deep in the cornea, uh, and certainly I do not believe that, you know, that mechanical stress will affect stem cells, but it will really affect um, the uh, the uh, corneal tissue itself and the epithelial cell, and you'll develop chronic staining or that, and that can trigger neovascularization because of that mechanical stress over the limbal area, and it's very, very prone to create that kind of vascularization. So this is why it's really crucial to understand that even if we recommend to limit the clearance over the central cornea, that does not mean that we can allow any touch in any part of the cornea. Make sure that the limbus is cleared and make sure that you have a vault of at least 40 microns, but no more than 60 microns, 75 microns over that limbus, because you know higher uh, clearance over the limbus will be associated with more debris, more fogging, and at a given point, also conjunctival prolates, especially in the inferior uh, cornea. If you have some room, some space available there for sure, because of the uh, suction effect under the scleral lens, uh, the, the conjunctiva will, will will tend to drape over the uh, the limbal area. And personally, even if it's considered, but I am not really uh, really comfortable to let a patient go on a chronic basis with that. So optimally, 40, 60 microns over the limbus is sufficient. And this is a nice tool published by. Um, uh, by, by Ferris State University, and you can have the same picture. Here the picture are from Andrea Lasby, uh, my uh, Canadian colleague from Calgary. Uh, you can evaluate through the sit lamp if you have clearance or if you have an excessive clearance, certainly, as you do uh, on the central cornea. In any doubt, let the patient go because under 40 microns of clearance, it, it, it will be difficult, especially under blue light. You won't see any fluorescein at all. Uh, so it will be difficult. If you are looking from the side, if you your illumination is at 30, 40 degrees angle, you can have a shadowing effect on the opposite, you know, uh, area. Meaning that if your illumination is temporal in the nasal portion of the cornea, you can have a shadowing effect just because of the scleral uh, anterior surface profile, and you you may be misleaded and you can misdiagnose those patients as having a limbal touch. Uh, so it's, it's, I prefer to evaluate that under white light and to see from 
one side to end to the other side as you see on, on the uh, on on the right hand side of that slide so uh, on the upper uh, upper slide it's a limited clearance over there where the green begins you know way over the limbus you know mid part of the cornea uh to the contrary the uh, on the bottom slide um you have a very very nice uh, grain band at the limbus, and this is what really we want to see under white line very, very easy, easy. And as I said, in any doubt, let the patient go, have the patient back for a regular follow-up one, one or two weeks uh, later, and then uh, you, you will see if you have a compression ring like it is displayed here on the left hand side of the, uh, of this, of the, um, of that slide. Here you'll you'll have you'll have staining you'll have compression and certainly it's not acceptable. So if you if you have that issue, you can ask manufacturers. Every manufacturer can do that. They will modify just the curve over the limbus, the mid peripheral curve. They can do that without impacting the overall fit of your sterile and the other curves as well. So um, just consult with the manufacturers and or increase the lens um, as. Dr. Barr's, you know, study showed 14.3 is probably too too limited for average normal cornea, uh, Asian cornea perhaps, but you know, in in any case, uh, you have to go a little bit larger in or to um, as the lamp to modify a little bit your design in order to uh, address that. Back to Michael now. Okay, we're going to go through a few different issues that may seem benign, but things that you might see when you are uh, evaluating scleral lens wearers who are wearing lenses for the first time. What we call epithelial bogging is basically a lens that's just soaked with fluid, and basically it's bathed with a reservoir of tears for many, many hours, and you get the effect like the uh, wrinkling of your skin after being in the pool for too long or in the bathtub, whatever, but it changes the electrolyte balance and the uh, changes in the cornea. And I guess I feel like this is not something I've seen a lot of. And I think if we do see it, it's maybe early on. And I think the cornea, it seems to adapt to this and that uh, it does get better with time. Definitely uh, something you want to keep watch on, and certainly it's not something you want to see getting worse as patients wear lenses longer. Something that we see significantly more commonly is, you know, keratitis, what we call toxic keratopathy. When you, either with the lenses on or without, you can look and you can see significant staining, and usually this is very fine focal staining. And general reason for this has to do with uh, lenses being applied with solutions that have a preservative in there. And as we said before, there's not a lot of tear circulation under that lens. And as such, preservatives that are under there stay in contact with the cornea for a long time. And this creates uh, this little focal toxicity reaction showing up as the uh, staining and maybe a little bit of edema localized. And it generally results in redness and uh, some discomfort, maybe even some light sensitivity as well. But uh, to really deal with that, number one is only use preservative-free saline in the bowl. Uh, use uh, preservative-free cleansing solutions and even discontinue preservative-free solutions that have a buffering agent, uh, like Unisol, but we don't have Unisol anymore. And I've seen some of these even with PuroLens, and that's another preservative-free, but again, it's not in all of these. So again, it's something that happens with certain patients. But again, you have to evaluate the patients and question them in great detail about what solution they're using at what stage of the process of cleaning and application, because again, they may take shortcuts. They may start using a preserved solution because they couldn't find a preservative-free one, but this is a much more common uh, observation. This next topic with scleral lenses and, and its effect on interocular pressure is a very uh, controversial one, and it's uh, very difficult to prove this, but Again, the forces of where the lens is bearing near the limbus may have effects on Schlem's canal underneath, the limbal blood vessels, the limbal vasculature underneath can be affected. So 
again, the, the challenge on this is that it's difficult to measure the pressure uh, without uh, taking the lens off. There are devices now that can do that on the sclera outside and get very valid readings. And there was one study that uh, Muriel Shornack published on that. And it was uh, shown that there were some minor effects. But again, there may be effects on actually just removing the lens, the suctional forces that are um, created when you remove a lens may have some temporary effects on eye pressure. But it is something that you definitely have to keep in mind and should check pressure after uh, removal of scleral lenses on your patients. And then with the ideal well-fitting lens, we hope we don't create that. In other words, that there's gentle bearing 360 degrees and it's landing very evenly all around and it's not excessively tight. So again, especially if we're working with patients who may have glaucoma, who have had glaucoma uh, devices implanted into their eye, and we certainly don't want our scleral lenses to affect the pressure. So again, just a quick review on topography. Usually we do not use corneal topography to actually determine the fit of the lens. We use the corneal topography to determine the elevation of the cornea, and that is determining what we're going to use to clear the cornea. But in addition to corneal topography, we now have scleral topography available, where the lens lands on the sclera can be mapped out with the eaglet device and the uh, SMAP 3D that's on the bottom here. And Again, we've been able to map this out for normal patients, and we know in general that the larger we are fitting a scleral lens, uh, the area that is landing is more toric in nature, and that it is not spherical. And the contours of the sclera are found not to relate to the toricity of the cornea. And so it can be totally different than what the cornea is. But in general, we are finding that nasally, the conjunctival contour overlying the sclera is flatter and is higher. So when a lens is placed on the eye, it will land on the nasal area first and then tend to be decentered temporally, as that temporal side is steeper in curvature but actually lower in height. And this would be an example of a lens in, that had excessive scleral bearing where you see this blanching uh, on the, where it's actually compressing the blood vessels so they can't get through and it's uh, restricting blood flow there. Where the picture on the right is just a higher edge lift or a flatter peripheral curve or even toric haptics are made to align the lens better 360 degrees. And this is just another example, kind of a close-up of what you might see. And you definitely do not want to see this. When you see these kinds of things, you definitely want to have a lens change to one that has a higher edge lift that doesn't bear as heavily. And again, you have to look very carefully in all meridians because you may see this kind of a picture that you see right here and the, the right here in one meridian and be totally clear in another one. So again, looking at all 360 degrees is really critical. Again, just evaluating the edge on the upper left is what you see is a very high edge lift. It's not as commonly seen, but this is what you might call fluting in a soft lens and where you see it's just lifting up. And generally the patients will tell you right away that that lens is not comfortable. Whereas this picture over on the upper right, pretty normal alignment. You can see the blood vessel as it goes under the edge of the lens is not deflected here and here. And again, there's just starting to be a little bit of an impingement here, and this may show up later in the day after lenses have been worn for a while. And this over here in the lower right is definitely becoming excessive and is not gonna be pleasant to look at or is not gonna be comfortable for the patient. Now, how do you deal with these issues? Besides making the peripheral curve flatter, again, you may not be able to do this with the same peripheral curve, 360 degrees. Uh, some patients have been taken care of quite nicely with what we would call toric peripheral curves, where it's flatter horizontally, steeper vertically. Some of them are even made with various meridians, four or eight meridian 
differences, different curvature, different shape in each quadrant or in each meridian. It's really difficult to assess these, uh, the need for the toricity at the slit lamp, but if you get a little better at this, you watch very carefully, you can watch the impingement. Those blood vessels will tell you where it's bearing, but again, the uh, peripheral and the scleral topography is being worked on now to actually do this more empirically before you order your first lens to be able to know exactly how much toricity there is out there where the lens is landing. And again, each lab does their peripheral curves and how wide the landing zone is, just a little bit different. So definitely check with them and ask them how to deal with the issue, but make very careful observations on this. Again, problem solving, certainly one of the reasons we use scleral lenses is because they are so comfortable. But you can kind of listen very carefully to what the patients are telling you and what you're seeing. And if you get discomfort at right after application, you know that lens is probably either too small or the edge is lifting up too flat, like we just showed you in that picture earlier. Let's say, for example, uh, you're getting discomfort you know, after during the fitting process, they, they say it's comfortable when your first goes in, but a half hour later, it's not comfortable. You may look at the lens and say, well, that bubble wasn't there when I first put it in, but maybe it's there now. Some bubbles have crept in there. Definitely check right after application to make sure you have no bubbles there at first. If you're getting discomfort later in the day, after four or five hours, the lens may be settling excessively and it may be a little too tight. So you're losing some clearance and increasing the area at the periphery where the lens is bearing a little more heavily. Um, basically, you may have to change the clearance of the lens. You may have to increase the clearance. You may decrease, but you definitely want to get more a flatter peripheral curve so that the lens is not bearing so heavily. Uh, generally, when there is just debris under the lens, like we showed in some of the first slides, it's not going to be generally uncomfortable. It will affect vision, though. So uh, it's not going to really come in complaining of discomfort. So again, we talked about bubbles at application. No matter how steep you fit the lens, no matter how much clearance, generally, if you put the lens in correctly, there will not be bubbles. And so bubbles are caused by uh, air getting under the lens as you're putting it in, it gets trapped. And it's not something you can press on the lens to squeeze it out of there. You have to actually remove the lens and reapply it. It will not go away. Um, it will affect vision if it's large enough. And again, it will be uncomfortable if the bubble is stationary because that area under the bubble is dry and it's going to hurt. So again, to get rid of that, you got to train that patient to do that best. Sometimes you have to use a little cocktail of different types of solutions in the bowl and make sure the technique is good and to uh, possibly even reduce the diameter to help get the lens in easier. If you get bubbles that are definitely not there at first when you put it in, you come back 20 minutes later, you see bubbles, the lens is loose peripherally in one particular meridian and the lens as they blink is actually rocking and pumping air bubbles under the lens. So you have to determine where that's coming from and address those issues with generally toric peripheral curves. And again, reducing the diameter for that. Again, we talked about a lens being too tight. What's going to happen then? They're going to feel comfortable initially, but it will become uncomfortable over time. You will see redness. You will be sometimes difficult to remove because it's squeezed onto the eye like that. And again, the conjunctival tissue is different for each patient. You may see lenses settle a lot more and you thought you had a great fit, but again, when you're seeing something like this later, it definitely is not a happy situation. So again, the peripheral curvature of the lens, the peripheral dynamics have to match the conjunctiva that that's being fit on. And again, it generally involves um, reducing central clearance, but particularly flattening the periphery so that it lifts away a little bit. Again, make sure you review their handling techniques because there have been instances where patients were putting the lens in and pushing way too hard and, and just pressing the lens and making it settle too much, you know, initially. And so it just sucked onto the eye later, but a gentle pressure in reviewing that. 
Wanjis is going to finish up with some customizations that we use on scleral lenses. So here you go, Wanjis. Very rapidly, thank you, Michael, because we uh, we want to have a few minutes more for to answer to uh, questions that you know people in the audience may have. Uh, when do we need to consider customized lenses? Uh, lenses, uh, obviously, when when we have to deal with uh, vision, and most of the time it's because uh, we have residual astigmatism or induced astigmatism because of lens distortion. I already covered that. The lens is misaligned with the conjunctiva and you don't have a perfect fit in every quadrant, then the lens can be distorted by the blinking process and you can end up with you know some uh, residual astigmatism in place. And or because you cancel the corneal cylinder with the tear fluid, fluid layer, then the lenticular astigmatism can come in play and you can do nothing against that except to prescribe a front toric surface and this is considered a customization of sterile lenses. Oblate profiles, if you can uh, advance the slides, Michael, please. Uh, astigmatism again. Uh, so for troubleshooting toric front surface and certainly to increase lens thickness as far as astigmatism is not a way to go because you will just penalize the cornea even more for exigent delivery and at my personal experience that, you know, thicker lenses, you still have some some flashers you are misaligned with the conjunctiva. So, Oblate, go back one slide, please. Uh, oblate designs are, 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 are there for many reasons, namely to accommodate oblate corneas, but more and more they are used to uh, limit the minus power of, of the correction uh, on prolate corneas and or on irregular corneas as well. Because Oblate lenses, in fact, are made with a flatter base curve, uh, but er in the central area, but every other areas are exactly the same. So let's say that you have, you know, a minus 10 sliver lens on, on an eye. If you adapt the oblate profile compensating for the loss of clearance, um, as for the base curve is changed, uh, then you can end up with a minus five or minus six lens uh, at the end instead of minus 10. So it helps the patients to see better because we gain up to 2% of um, increase in image size, which is huge. 2% seems not a lot, but you know, it's huge as for image size. Uh, and, and certainly it helps the patient to, to see better, especially for presbyopic patient, high minus presbyopic patient. If you change you know, their prescription for oblate, profile multifocal serial lenses, boom, it's a wow effect every time you just boost the addition power. And as for, uh, as a last word, um, if you are dealing with very, very irregular surface, like if you have a bleb, if you have an eccentric pupil, if you have a semblifaron, um, if you have anything that is not really customizable with the regular design of several lenses, not, a, not available, not, not adaptable with a micro vault, let's say that, uh, not adaptable with toric peripheries and or specific design, then you have to mold that eye and the technology is now available. It's really fantastic technology. You mold the eye very comfortable for, for the patient. No uh, an, an aesthetic drops needed. Um, it takes two minutes to, um, to take the mold and then you send them all to the lab and out of that, they, they will derive 26,000 different points to design a lens really, really customized to that surface. And they can do anything you want as for power, they can do multifocal, they can do prismatic lenses, any axis, because that lens is certainly well aligned in every quadrant and you can specify any other condition you may want as for clearance, lens thickness, all that stuff. So it's really the way to go and to customize your lenses uh, is, uh, as you need for a specific population. So in conclusion, uh, sclerosis lenses may be challenging, but you know it's really, really feasible, and, and it, it's baby steps. But you know, step by step, you you can certainly learn how to troubleshoot these common things we mentioned today. And you need, in in fact, two to three different designs and sizes, as as you would do with multifocal, soft multifocal lenses or soft toric lenses, uh, because every patient is different, and you have to address you know major issues. In my practice, for example, I'm dealing with 15 millimeter sterile lenses for 80% of my patients, and I'm really clearing the cornea, clearing the limbus. I have no issue with deposits, no issue with you know conjunctival alignment, um, and for normal corneas that 
that's the way to go. A regular cornea is low to moderate ectasia, the way to go. But I'm, I'm still needing larger lenses for high ectasia, for pellucid marginal degeneration, for example, to treat eye disease and, and to address very severe eye dryness. And again, it's a risk-benefit ratio for those special patients. The benefit of having a larger lenses uh, is certainly higher compared to any kind of, you know, um, other risk provided by, by the lens thickness or the clearance and our other you know elements that you that you may have so I really need two different designs and and two different sizes so three four sets in, in my practice is at least a minimum but for each of these designs you have to know the limitations of your lenses and consult with the lens these are great 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 uh, resources that you have to consult with because they know their product and they can help you a lot, you know, with, with your cases. Send them your topos, your photos, your videos, and certainly they can help you a lot. And every lab has fantastic, you know, people are really ready to help you with, with, with your that problem. Was a, that was a great uh, summary, Langis. I think uh, we do have time for maybe one or two questions now. And uh, I don't know if Drew is on there, but uh, yeah. you got some questions for either of us now. Yeah, we had a few, and Langis really uh, hit on one right at the end, which talked about uh, recommended diameters in general for scleral lenses. And it sounded like he recommended 15 0 for the majority of patients, 18 0s for uh, high ectasias, peripheral uh, elevations, and dry eye. Do you have anything to add to that, Michael? No, I would say uh, a majority of mine are probably around 15 and a half to 16. And uh, I do, the, the, as Langis alluded to, the more irregular and the more dry eye, severe dry eye patients definitely seem to do better with larger lenses that probably in the range of around 18 to 19 millimeters. Great. Uh, another question is going back to what Langis was talking about with corneal edema. Uh, and oxygen, is there any adaptation that occurs? In other words, does edema improve uh, throughout wear time, e even with a, a standard uh, lens thickness and, and uh, central vault? Unfortunately not, you know, the cornea do not adapt, but we don't know the long-term effect of that chronic hypoxia on normal tissue and normal cornea and or on irregular cornea as well. And that's the big question we still want to answer uh probably is doing it's doing nothing probably it may do you know some harm on the long term we don't know really don't know so i prefer to stay on the safe side and to limit my clearance and my lens thickness to this point without knowing that long-term effect but what we know is and john jealous proved that you know, in a series of cases with with uh, corneal graft patients, and it really tracked the pachymetry of those corneas because he fitted the lens according to manifold recommendation at, at the uh, at the beginning, and he saw that swelling up to 150 to 100 microns in some part of the cornea occurring, and he he did a minimalist approach, you know, lowering the the, the clearance and lowering the lens thickness, and he saw those cornea being back to the baseline level as for pachymetry uh, reading. So it, 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 we can really reverse the swelling if we change the adaptation of that lens. But if we keep the same lens with the same clearance, unfortunately, there is no indication that the cornea will adapt and we will, you know, I, I would say, survive uh, over time with that kind of hypoxic stress. Very good. And then, and then final question here. Uh, we all know scleral lenses are very comfortable uh, and should be comfortable from, from day one. Assuming a good fit, what kind of adaptation can uh, a new wearer expect with the scleral lens as far as end of the day, uh, symptoms or uh, adaptation? It's an interesting question. I don't know if we see the same kind of adaptation that you would with uh, certainly a corneal lens. I mean, I, I start many of the scleral wearers off wearing them eight to 10 hours a day, and uh, it seems to do very, very well for them. They, they do quite nicely. The goal is that we can have them wear them all their waking hours. Uh, try as we might, there are still some patients who still have to remove lenses midday, but I would say that's becoming uh, a little more uh, less frequent, less frequent now. Uh, but we try to get them to wear them all their waking hours and uh, pretty easy adaptation if minimal. 
Very well, good. One, one element I would add to this is I agree with Michael, but uh, as as I think that the take home message is uh, be be careful about the clearance over time. I saw a few patients coming back after eight, nine, 12 months. And uh, when they, they left the office after their regular first month follow up, everything was fine. The clearance after four, five, six hours was great. You know, around 125, 150 microns, exactly what we want. But when I saw them back a year later, I think that the conjunctiva can vary over time and the sinking of these scleral lenses can be a little bit more after a few months, few few years, depending on the, the nature of the conjunctiva and every patient is different there. That's so, a great point, yeah, because I think just like we mentioned, you know, there's different uh, patients who will have different settling amounts and there are definitely different settling amounts over time. And that some patients, you know, when after a week of wearing lenses, that's how their lenses are going to be forever. But uh, I definitely have seen what Langis is describing, where, um, you know, six months later, that, that same lens that looked wonderful is not uh, performing the exact same way. There's less clearance. So, yeah, even, even to the point to touch the cornea, and obviously you have to refit the patient at that time. So make sure that, you know, it, it won't happen too much and too, too often. Well, thank you gentlemen so much. A couple of just quick things before we uh, log off here. Our next webinar will be on October 25th. It's entitled Scleral Lens Publication Update. You'll be seeing some emails arriving shortly to register for that. We hope to see everybody there. This lecture uh, was COPE approved for one hour of COPE credit. Uh, expect an email in the next seven days at the most uh, with a 10 uh, question quiz. It'll need to be filled out and returned. All instructions will be included in that email, uh, and then you'll receive your certificate for COPE credit, assuming you get a 70% or better. Uh, gentlemen, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you guys in a few months. Good night, everybody. Good night.